Okay. So, today, I would like to share with you two words that have the power to change our life for the better. And I will uh, begin with a story. Some time ago, a student walked into Chabad house, and this student looked like he had every reason to be happy in life. Smart, successful, popular, talented, came from a loving family. Sometime after I got to know the student, the student says, Rabbi, I want to discuss things with you. And in the conversation, it became clear that it was the exact opposite. He said that, he says, Rabbi, I have many problems. I have so many problems in my life. What are the problems? He says, I'm not smart. I'm not talented. I'm not liked. I'm not creative. I'm not a good Jew. And he was very sad about all of his issues. So I told him, that uh, you don't have many problems. You have one problem. What's the common denominator be all, be between all of his issues? Two, two words. He had a problem with his I am's. I'm not handsome. I'm not smart. I am not talented. I'm not a good Jew. The two words, I am, have the power to change our life. Those two words, I am, then the question becomes, what are you? What word do you put after those two words, I am? So if we put something negative after those two words, then what we put there actually will dominate our life. But if after I am, we put I'm successful, I'm happy, I'm going to overcome this setback. I'm talented, I'm blessed, I'm happy. If after I, uh, are the I am's, we put positive and virtuous and good things, then those talents and those capacities blossom in our life. They become real and they gain extra power. Let me illustrate how this works. For close to 2,000 years, we have records of the fact that human beings never thought it was possible for a person to break a four-minute mile. Because human bone structure, the physiology of the human being was such that people thought that we cannot run faster than that speed. Can't break a four-minute mile. In 1954, an athlete by the name of Roger Bannister was a medical student, and he decided, I am capable of breaking the four-minute mile. And he trained hard, and in 1954, he broke the four-minute mile. He broke it by one second. And it was the cover of the newspapers around the world. Roger Bannister breaks the four-minute mile, first time in recorded human history. So for a thousand years, people woke up and said, I am not capable of breaking the four-minute mile. A human being wakes up one morning and says, I am capable, and therefore I will work to accomplish it and accomplishes it. But here is what is truly extraordinary about this story. A few months after Bannister broke the world record, there was another race. And 37 runners all broke the four-minute mile. 37 runners. That's extraordinary. How did that happen? For 2,000 years, no one. And now 37 people within a few months after Bannister breaks the record. So what, what changed in seven months? Human bone structure? Human the lung capacity? Of course not. Bone structure didn't change. Human perception of what was possible changed. Until Bannister broke that record, human beings woke up and said, I am incapable 
of breaking that record, and therefore they didn't. But when human beings woke up in the morning, when an athlete would wake up and say, I am capable of doing it, so now they have inner strength and a goal to look forward to, and that allows those capacities to come out in life. So the question is, what are we putting after I am's? Are we putting upbeat, positive, healthy thoughts, or negative? You have a similar study, an academic study, that illustrates a similar point. They, uh, a university, they had a scientist select many people. It was a social experiment. And they had a makeup artist draw on people's faces an ugly scar alongside a person's face. And they said, with this scar, we want you to go into social surroundings and have conversations with people and see how the scar affects your interactions and your conversation. Now, they did this with a bunch of people, but with one twist. As the fellow with the scar that the makeup artist painted on the face was about to go back into society to discuss and interact with people, the artist said, hold on one second, we have a little touch-up to make. And what the artist really did was erase the scar. But the person was unaware of that fact. And these people, the volunteers, went out and they spoke to people at Starbucks and other places for hours and they came back to report the results. And the results were the conversations were awkward, people were embarrassed to look at me, and they were looking away, they felt nervous, so all my conversations were awkward. Now how interesting is that? (laughs) That The awkwardness and the fact that they looked strange was all in their mind. It wasn't reality. These people looked regular. They didn't have a scar on their whole face. But because in their mind they thought they had one, they were the ones actually that were started to behave strange. And that caused other people to have unusual or strange conversations with them. But it wasn't because they were truly scarred in that sense. It was because it was in their mind. It was a mindset. And with this we understand a famous story in the Bible. God comes to Moses at the burning bush and he says, Moses, I am selecting you to be an an ambassador of God. I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to liberate the Jews from Egypt and bring them to the promised land. So here you have ancient Egypt, the greatest empire ever lived, with immense power. And Moses, selected by God to liberate the Jewish people. How does Moses respond to God's call? Moses says, God, you want me to do this incredible thing? Moses says, I can't do it. Me, Anochi. I am nobody. That's what he says in Hebrew. Me, Anochi. I am nobody. I am a stutterer. I am incapable. So Moses views himself as somebody who has physical challenges and is not up to the task. He literally says, I am nobody. I am a stutterer. So Moses, in, in his perception, was telling God, God, I don't doubt your existence, but I do doubt my capabilities. I am not capable. I can't, I'm not articulate. How do you want me to influence Pharaoh? It's a good question. He says that I'm not capable. So God tells Moses, Moses, I know what your shortcomings are. Moses did have some kind of speech impediment. The Bible says so. But what God tells Moses is, Moses, you need to understand that I am going to go with you to Pharaoh. I'm not going to send you alone. And in the words the Torah uses are, Anoichi shelachticha. I am sending you. I am with you. So Moses, instead of you saying, Mi Anochi, I am nobody, you need to change that. And after I am, say, I am God's ambassador. God says, I am 
going to send you. I am going to be with you as you go to Pharaoh. So Moses, you have the power to make the world better, to redeem the Jewish people, to redeem the slaves, to take down an evil empire. Why? Because I don't send you out into the world to do this great task alone, without capacity. After I am Moses put, I am God's ambassador. When Moses understood and began to perceive himself not as I am incapable, but I am an ambassador of God, an emissary of God, and now I will go take on this great evil force, Moses was able to do so, and he changed all of human history. But Moses needed to change that perception as well, from me, I am nobody, to I am an ambassador of God. Now, what's interesting is that human perception, the way the mind works, is not really set up for happiness and for optimism in many, many cases. Why? Because a strong part of the mechanism of the brain is there to help us survive and to watch out for danger. And when we detect danger, to take flight from it. Fight or flight mechanism. So the mind is like a radar machine, always scanning for what's wrong, what are, what's the challenge. And that could create a mindset where a person, after the I am, we place, I'm anxious, I'm fearful, I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about my children, I'm worried about my job, my career, my relationships. Why? Because for a human being to survive, you need to have a mechanism that's always looking out for what is dangerous. To illustrate this in a very simple fashion, how it can work against us in terms of happiness, is we've all had an experience where we walk into a room or we're in a room alone and suddenly we hear like a thud or a loud noise and we are startled and we're frightened because we're afraid who knows what's happening. Did it ever happen to you once in your life that you hear this thud, a large noise, and you say, oh wow, maybe a bag of gold just dropped in and I'm wealthy. You never thought that once in your life. You never responded to some frightening noise, a loud noise, but wow, some blessing just fell into my backyard. Never. Why? Because that's not how we're programmed. The mind is not programmed to think, oh, a thud, it's a sack of gold. No. We're programmed to think a tree's falling, an earthquake, somebody's going to rob my home. So the mind often scans the world and is always looking for what is wrong. But there is another way to live because the software of our minds could be over. We could download another software. A human being has the capacity to think positive, to place after the I am, not I am fearful, I am worried, but I am going to wake up and be positive today. I am going to look at every situation today in the most positive way and then run towards that objective. And now we understand something so beautiful in Jewish tradition. And it's incredibly deep. What are the first words a Jew is called upon to say in the morning when they gain consciousness? In bed? Before you even get out of bed? The traditional prayer is, open up any prayer book, it's right there. Moda ani lefonecha. I am grateful. Isn't that beautiful? The first thing a Jew downloads is, after the I am, grateful, gratitude. Judaism is saying that when you wake up in the morning, look at the world, and right away start to focus on reality in terms of, I'm grateful for being alive. Thanks, God, for giving me a new day, for health, for my relationships, for the incredible opportunities. So instead of waking up and saying, I am fearful, I am incapable, but the opposite, I am grateful. So Judaism is saying that we have to download right in the morning, and obviously then we continue with other blessings. The perspective needs to be to after the I am's to put not fearful, but happy, but grateful, and then move forward in an optimistic fashion. I remember as a child, I was in 770, the big Chabad headquarters in New York, and it was late at night, there was a big Fabringen, a Hasidic gathering, and an old fellow, he was nine years old, 
He was quite agile, and he kind of jumped over a bench, and he squeezed into the Fabrengen. So somebody sitting there who had a Lachayim turns to him and says, al he says, you old, old fellow. He says, how do you have that agility? You're nine years old. Jump over a bench, you just sit down. 90, how do you do it? So the guy says, I'm not an old man of 90 years old. I am three young men of 30. Beautiful. So you wake up in the morning, I am old, or I am three strong men of 30. What do we put after I am? You could say, I am 90, and you're 90. I am weak, I'm tired, I'm uninspired, or I am three young men of 30. That is a perspective, that's a mindset. That's That's understanding that when we wake up in the morning, download after the I am positive identification. Look at everything in the best possible way. And we'll conclude with the most iconic story in the Bible that illustrates this perspective. The Hebrew wording is so accurate and so relevant in terms of this topic. And that is when the Jews leave Egypt and they want to go to the promised land, to Eretz Yisrael, God tells Moses to send spies. So Moses sends spies, Miraglam. Ten spies go to scout out the land and they come back with negative reports. They say, we are not capable of conquering Israel. They're too powerful. They will destroy us. We will be defeated. Why do you want to attempt such a thing? We'll die in that endeavor. We're not capable. And they say, we are grasshoppers. We're like grasshoppers compared to the powerful people in that space. So their I am's are all terrible. We're weak. We're incapable. We're grasshoppers. That's after they, their I am, they put grasshoppers. We're grasshoppers. We are grasshoppers, they said. From our perspective, we look like grasshoppers compared to this task that we're called on. So we can't do it. Two spies, Yeshua and Kalev, come back and they have a positive report. After their I am's, they have positive things. We are capable of conquering the land and it will be successful. God is with us. God's with us, of course we'll be able to do it. And it will be wonderful, and the land will help sustain the Jewish people. After their I am's, they put only positive and wonderful things. Now listen to this closely. Listen to the depth and the accuracy of the text. Do you know how God responds? God tells all of the spies, I'll quote it in Hebrew. He says to them, Kasher di bartem, as you spoke... Cain, Esa, so so will be. To the group of spies that said, we cannot do it, I am not capable, we will die in the desert. That's how you spoke, that's what you said, that's what will happen. Kasher di bartem, as you perceive it, as you articulated it, Cain, Esa, so will be. But to the spies, to Yeshua and Kalev who said, we are capable and we will be victorious and we will enter, you said we can do it, so you will be able to do it. And that is true to each of us in our journey in life. Like Moses, we all have shortcomings. We all have a scar. Who here is perfect? We all have challenges that we were born with. And then we have mistakes that we made in life. Things that we did that we're embarrassed of. Things that happened to us, perhaps no fault of our own, but by the environment in which we live. So everybody has certain impediments and scars in life. That is true. But the question is, what are we putting after the I am? What are we downloading? As we go through the mission, as we go through our mission in life, because everybody has a mission, everybody's on a journey, and everybody's really traveling to a promised land, to a better place, to be the best we can be, to make the world and our environment the best it could be. And we're not alone on the mission. We are walking with God, ambassadors of God. Everyone's an ambassador of God to bring blessing and goodness and holiness to their own space and their own environment. But if, like the spies, we say we will be able to enter the promised land, we will achieve our goals, that we can break limitations like that banister mindset. Don't tell me this can't be done. It could be done. I'll have the mindset that I am capable of breaking this barrier that myself or others say I'm incapable of breaking. 
Don't tell me I can't conquer this challenge or overcome this setback. I am capable. And it begins every morning by saying, I am grateful. I'm grateful because I'm a child of God, powered by God, to walk through life with happiness, with optimism, to overcome those challenges. And so, friends, let us march on to the promised land. Bye-bye.